In Jesus' name, amen. If, uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles to the text uh, today, we're looking at Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, and I'll begin reading this morning in verse 13, and I'll read down through uh, verse 21 as we continue in our sermon series in the parables of Jesus, a, a series that I've entitled Stories of Eternal Weight. And so uh, if you have been here over the last couple of weeks, we started this a uh, few weeks back, and uh, it's a series that will take us through the summer. We're looking at 16 of Jesus' parables. There's a lot more than that, and so I'm selective in sort of choosing the parables for us to, uh, uh, to focus on. And so two weeks ago we started, and uh, today we're going to pick up looking at uh, a parable called the parable of the rich fool. Uh, so beginning in verse 13, this is God's word. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother, to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And this is God's word. May the Lord bless uh, its reading, its preaching, and of course, may he also bless us by his spirit as we hear it and respond. You know, we we live in an incredibly wealthy nation, right? I mean, it kind of goes without saying everybody knows that. We do. Um, One of the wealthiest nations in the world, uh, one of the wealthiest nations that's ever existed in in the world, right? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have poverty, and we do. I mean, we probably see it all the time when we, you know, go out our doors and go around in in Miami. Some of us uh, during our lives may have been in different states of poverty. And yet at the same time, when I say that and affirm that and know that's true, it's, it's also true to say that even if we who are gathered here, let's just talk about us, even if we don't consider ourselves, yourself, myself, to be rich compared to the riches, uh, it, we have to understand that to most people in the world, wherever you probably are today, they would probably think that you are, are rich, right? They probably would. Most people in the world would. Now, why am I saying that? Well, the purpose of saying that today isn't to put a guilt trip on anyone, because that's not my, my reason for talking about this. It's to connect you to the passage And to connect you to the passage, just sort of recognizing, as we do so, the the world that we live in and the things that we have and the advantages that we have and the privileges that we have, but also with that, some of the dangers that we face. I mean, to have things, to have, you know, wealth and money and resources and all those things gives us wonderful opportunities to do things, uh, to be a blessing, right? Uh, that's certainly the case. That's what stewardship is really all about. It's, it's, it's using resources for both common and kingdom good. And I hope all of us, when we think about the things that God has placed within our care, that we think of them that way, that we think according to stewardship, that we think about the, the resources God has given us for common good, which is really talking about, you know, sort of how we use resources in relationship to ourselves and family and others to bless but also that we think about kingdom good and using all that God has placed in our care and thinking about how do we use those things for the sake of the kingdom, to bless the church, to advance God's kingdom through missions and ministry and all those kinds of things. Those are ways of thinking about what God has placed in our hands. Also though, we need to understand that regardless of what we have, because we live in um, what I, I would have to s- describe as, and you would probably all agree with me, I doubt if I get any pushback on this, we live in an incredibly materialistic society, right? Is that, is that true? I mean, it's an incredibly materialistic society. Because we do, regardless of where you may find yourself on the socioeconomic scale, you are affected by that reality, right? That we all sort of breathe that in. And because we, we can breathe that in, there are dangers, spiritual dangers, 
that we can all face, regardless of how much money we have or don't have, because we live in a world like this, right? And the Bible is full of all of these kinds of warnings about money and about how we use money and about how we think about money. I mean, today in our reading earlier in the service, Greg read from Revelation chapter 3. And I chose that passage because it's Jesus' message to a particular church that's, that's sort of lukewarm, not hot, not cold. And, and Jesus actually describes there sort of how they thought, how they thought. And here's what, what he says. This is in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. This is that church. This is their thinking. I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. I need nothing. That is one of the dangers of sort of a materialistic world and life view. It's a sense of I have everything and I need nothing, which means I don't even really need God, right? It's finding sufficiency in the things that you have. We are probably all familiar with the, the words of Jesus are, are well known. And when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, you cannot serve God and money. You can't serve God and money, right? Because there's a, there's a tendency of idolatry there, right? It's what, you know, the late Tim Keller has a book called Counterfeit Gods. You've probably, some of you heard of it and maybe, maybe even read it. It's, it's about that. It's these, these, what are these kinds of things in a, in a materialistic world that, that pull like gods, and pull us into idolatry. There are spiritual dangers. Now, as we, we draw our attention to the parable today, the parable of the rich fool, I, th I think this is part of what Jesus is dealing with. He's dealing with some of these, these, these dangers, not just of money or riches or possessions, but of just materialism in and of itself, right? And he talks about th three ways that we can sort of get pulled off of, of what I would say is a, is a sort of God-honoring sort of view of all of this, and we can go astray. We can go astray. And so I'm going to tell you what these things are as a part of guarding ourselves. And we find them actually in this passage, in, in this is the way you would divide up the passage. There's a, there's a setting of this passage, right, which remember last week I talked to you about, and actually the pre previous two weeks, with these parables, you always got to dig into the setting as well, okay? So there's a setting. This parable actually has a direct teaching of Jesus, and then he offers the parable as an example, right? So this is an example parable or an illustrative parable. It illustrates the direct teaching that Jesus gives here, okay? And so when you look at it that way, you'll see these three things. These are ways that we can go astray if this materialistic world just ha totally has us. We can go astray with the first thing is a wrong view of Jesus, okay? The second is a wrong view of possessions. And the third it's just the wrong view of life in our own lives, okay? A wrong view of Jesus, a wrong view of possessions, and a wrong view of life. So let's dig into this a little bit and think about what he's, what he's doing here. So the first of these is just the wrong view of Jesus. And I think this is part of what we see with this man, because here's what this man has done, and I'll show it to you in just a second, but I'm gonna tell you what he does first. This man has basically, he's in this sort of mindset where he, he basically sees Jesus as someone he can use to get what he wants. That's how he views him. He seeks to use Jesus to accomplish his own desire and his own goal. Right? And so if you notice the text, this is the setting of the text. This is verses 13 and 14 where it says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Okay. Now, one of the things I find really intriguing about looking at this particular parable, after looking at the parable we focused on last week, which is the parable of the Good Samaritan, is that both of these parables, in a way, are concerned about an inheritance, are they not? But if you remember last week's parable, with the parable of the Good Samaritan, the, the lawyer, he stands up in the crowd. So there's a crowd again, and this prompts all of Jesus' parables. But the lawyer stands up. And the lawyer basically, now his motives were wrong. And I said this to you last week, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. His motives were wrong. He was trying to test Jesus. He was trying to trap Jesus. But here's the question he asked, teacher, what shall I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? And so what is he concerned about? He's, he's concerned about an inheritance, is he not? But he's concerned about it, an eternal one. 
Something I said last week to you that I think is important is this is, this is the question. It is the question that every human being on planet earth has to sort of think about. And, and hopefully, and I hope all of you have come to the right conclusion on how do you inherit eternal life? And the answer, of course, is through the king who is giving these parables. Okay? Now, you take that, and then there's this dude. <laughs> and he's also concerned about inheritance, and I don't want you to misunderstand me, because I'm not saying inheritances or money or wealth are bad things in and of themselves. But the way this guy's going at it, wow. And one of the things you got to do in terms of understanding this setting of this parable correctly is realize this simple thing. And I won't go back and read it all for sake of time, but there is not one single thing in all of Luke 12 where Jesus is talking about the king, all the previous part of Luke 12, before this, Jesus is talking about his kingdom, knowing him, following him, all those kinds of things that would lead a dude sitting there to go, oh, he's talking about money. Let me ask them this question. Nothing is there. Which means this is just a flat out interruption. Hey, Jesus, can you help me get my money? Like, whoa, <laughs> that's something, right? That's something. We know how inappropriate and out of place it is. Because, I mean, there is Old, Old Testament sort of guidance regarding inheritance and, and those kinds of things. But Jesus just responds, and this shows how off base this man was. He's like, you know, dude, listen, I'm not your judge and arbitrator of these kinds of things, but why would he ask Jesus? Why go to him? Why, why just interrupt everything for this? Well, one reason is because, I mean, Jesus was popular. Jesus was being followed by thousands, it tells us. Jesus was an authority. He affirms him as teacher, so he would have thought he was, a, he was an authority. Maybe he could help him out because the only thing this man was really about is his money. That's it. Not the king or the kingdom. Not the very things that Jesus is there to bring. But he's concerned about getting his money and using Jesus to do it. Okay? Now, when... When we're taken, let's just not just talk about money, let's talk about materialism. When we're taken by materialism, and this is a, this is a problem that we can fall into. And we know what that is. I mean, we, we rightfully here in our tradition, we condemn it all the time. I cannot tell you how many times I've condemned this in our church. There's a whole theology that's driven around it. It's, it's prosperity theology, it's, it's health and wealth theology, it's that transactional sort of view of God and theology where, you know, if, if I put this in, if I put in some faith and I, I'm going to get back, right, I, I'm going to get back and expect God to give me back. It's a, it's a usury way of thinking about God, of thinking about Jesus, right? Now, are we ever guilty of that? Well, I, I certainly would imagine not that consciously, but I do wonder because I examine my own life at times and I look at myself and it's not that way. It's not like I live my life intentionally going, God, if I give you this, I'm expecting this in return. But here's what does happen. And this is typically when it will show itself in your life, whether the material things of this world, this present world, as opposed to eternity, mainly have your heart. And it's when you start to lose things you want. That's when you can see it. When you start to lose things, when you start to lose a job or lose money or lose reputation or lose a loved one, and then you begin to think, and I know it because I live in this realm at times, you begin to think, God, I've been faithful. I've given my life to you. I've loved you. 
why have you not given me this? Or why did you take this away? And we begin to doubt and question because in those moments, we're not submitting and loving the king. We're loving what we believe the king will give us that we want. So a wrong view of Jesus. Now that wrong view of Jesus leads to another thing that we see here, which is a wrong view of possessions, which is the second thing, a wrong view of possessions. And, and this is the next part of this, where, where it says this in, in verse 15. And so, so what Jesus does here is the, the man interrupts Jesus basically answers the man by saying, I'm not your arbitrator, I am not your judge. That's not what I'm here for, right? But then he takes what the man says and he uses it as an opportunity to teach everybody. And so notice the language of verse 15 because it goes past just the man and he, it says, and he said to them, to them, to the crowds, to everybody, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Okay, so he's clearly saying, directly saying, all right, you need, to, you need to watch out here. You need to take care, right? And you need to guard. And he says against all covetousness, some versions translate it all kinds of greed. You will certainly remember the 10th of the 10 commandments, which says thou shall not what? Covet. Thou shalt not covet, okay? And so what are we talking about when, when we, we see this idea of coveting or being covetous? What is that? It's, 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 to, it's this way of thinking about sort of constantly grasping for more, for more. That you have to have more, right? More things of this world. It's a, it's a, it's a lust for, for, for more stuff. And it's why you can translate it as greed because there's this sense of constantly wanting more. And the 10th the commandment actually says that you constantly are wanting more, are covering more of what your neighbor has. You want what they have. Because there's a sense in which you are not satisfied and not content with what God has given to you. So you got to have more. You're not trusting in his providential watch care of your life. you got to have more. Whatever the more is. Now, Jesus, he gives answer to this, if you look at the text. Because what he says is this, for one's life, and we all need to hear this. This is, oh my goodness. You're talking about a shot against the world? Here is a shot against the world. One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. We are not what we possess. Now, why is it so hard for us to get our heads around this simple idea? It's because everything in the world, it's almost like a headwind coming against us and it constantly is saying this, your worth, your value, your significance, your happiness, your very sense of yourself is determined by what you have, by your place in the world by the school you went to, by the house you live in and the cars you drive and the job you have and all of these different things. And I'm not saying that that stuff in and of itself is bad. I am not. But what I am clearly saying, what Jesus is saying here is that those things do not define you and they cannot. They cannot. Your worth is not what you have. Your worth is not what you do. Your worth is not determined by this world. And we almost raise our kids up to believe it. 
But it is not true. This is why when he says it doesn't consist in the abundance of, of your possessions, you then have to ask yourself, and, and, okay, if it doesn't consist in these things, the things that the, the world constantly is telling me, this is it. If I have more of this, if I have more of that, if I just have this thing, that I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be good. If the world is constantly saying that, and Jesus is saying it's not found in that, then brothers and sisters in Christ, what is it found in? Is it not? And this is what makes the man and his question so absurd. Because here is the king of glory standing in his midst right there in front of him. And he's like, dude, can you help me get my money? When everything wondrous, glorious, true, eternal, is found in our identity through this man and his life and death and resurrection for us. Right? When we don't see him, when we don't get him, when we don't honor and glorify him, when we don't find our worth in him, when we don't find our identity in him, when he is not our all in all, something else is going to take that place, I'm telling you. And it's going to be something in this world. And so Jesus is challenging that, right? A wrong view of possessions. Which leads to the parable, the third and final thing, which is ultimately, as I said, this parable is a, it, it's a, an example parable, an illustration parable, and it sort of elaborates. Because what he really is saying is that there's a, a, a wrong view, really, of life itself. I mean, we, we, we just have messed it all up, right? And we've thought wrongly about everything. And so the parable begins in verse 16 and goes down through verse 20 where he says, And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he, and he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And, and, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared. Whose will they be? Now, one of the things I want to point out to you, which is really interesting about this parable, and I want to make sure we understand this, and don't hear me wrong. You know, it's kind of one of those things, don't hear what I'm not saying. So I want to make it clear what I am saying and what I'm not saying. This man isn't condemned because of any immoral actions in terms of how he gained his wealth. He's not. This is not a statement negative about having wealth. It's not. It is not saying that this man gained what he has by stealing from people or by doing something unjust with people or by not paying people a fair wage. He, that, this parable is not about that. In, one, in, in a sense, I could say to you this, even though I don't think the man would have gotten this from what it says later in the parable, but I think it is true to say this. The reason why this man had the wealth he had is because he was blessed by God. Because what was his wealth? Bounteous, plentiful, fruitful harvest. It means that God provided the very means, because Scripture makes it very clear, that the sun rises and the rain falls on the just and the unjust. God had provided the very means by which wealth was created for this man. So that's not the problem. So what is the problem? The problem with this man is that everything he does here and all the ways he responds here it's all about himself. Okay? It's all about himself. And we see it through the, the repetition of pronouns. It's very clear here. In verses 17 through 19, five times the man says, I will do. It's all about him. I will do this. I will do this. And I'll do this. And I'll do this. And I'll do this. In addition to that, if you look closely at the text from verse 17 on, he talks about, listen to this. He talks about my crops, my barns, my grain, my goods, and my soul, my soul, 
and then he speaks to his soul. Now, the psalmist at times do that, right? But what the psalmist is doing is talking to his soul before God. This dude is talking to his soul like it's his. And what does he do? He says, because if it's all about him and all about what he sees around him, if it's all about that, material things and himself, then here's what he says. He says, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Well, it has to be the atheist world in life view, doesn't it? I mean, if there is no that, and there's only this and this, then A, I'm going to build it up, I'm going to collect it, and I'm going to I'm going to rest and relax, and I'm going to eat, and I'm going to drink, and I'm going to be happy. The only problem is that eternity immediately encroaches on this warped life view. And he dies that very night. (laughs) And what Jesus basically says is what, you know, a phrase we all know, and I'll put it in the colloquial, you ain't taking it with you, right? You're just not. You're not taking it with you. And we have enough evidence over the millennium, over the centuries, people have really tried. They really tried. I read a story this week about a guy who loved his, I can't remember what it was, it was a Rolls Royce or something like that, he loved it, and and he wanted to be buried with that Rolls Royce. And so he was buried, propped up, embalmed in that Rolls Royce, dug in the ground. He's in the ground. Guess what? His dead body is in that ground, and so is that Rolls Royce. And I won't even tell you where I think that man probably is. Right? You're not going to take it with you. Right? It doesn't do that. It doesn't offer that, Right? But the things of this world cannot provide those things for us. Now, this parable is really interesting because in this parable, Jesus has God speaking. Does he not? Has God speaking. And God's first word, first word out of God's mouth to this situation is this word, fool. Some versions actually translate it, you fool. (laughs) Fool. Now, that can be, and, and, you know, it can be rightly translated this way, foolish because all the ways that he's living, like considering what reality truly is, to the way he's living, thinking it's all about him, all about him gaining things, all about him putting things together, and all those things are going to lead to the good life, the happy life, and the very day he gets it, he dies. It's foolish. But I would also remind you what fool means in the Bible. David puts it this way in Psalm 14, 1. That the fool says in his heart, there is no God. There is no God. And that's what this man is doing. He's living his life as if God isn't there or God doesn't matter. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, I would challenge every last one of us. Because this parable, remember the parable's challenge. And the parable I think it challenges every last one of us to understand that the way to rightly respond to all of the push of the materialism of this world that we live in is to truly know that God is, and he is real. And what truly is best is living for him, right? This is why Jesus ends in verse 21 with these words. He says, so is the, is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Who is the one who lays up treasure for himself? That's the fool. That's what he's saying. He said, take this man as the example. So is the one, if, if your life is just spent laying up treasure for yourself, if money has become just a mechanism of your own identity, you take money and you use it to define your own glory as opposed to being rightfully a steward of it for God's glory. If it's just about building treasure, God God is saying to you, you are a fool. You are a fool. We need to treasure him. 
to know that he indeed is our all and all. Our all and all. And it's only then, when we begin to get this, that we actually begin to get this, right? And how to use these resources. To hear Jesus say, you can't serve God in money, and actually begin to get it, right? You know, I'm going to let a little secret out of the bag here, and uh, I don't know if you want me to be your pastor anymore, I have to tell you this, but I'll tell you. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm happy to be a fan. My wife knows this very well, because I have to... I, She's, uh, she's the recipient of something she hates because of this. I'm a fan of Christian rap music. I know it's weird, odd. I mean, I'm almost a 60-year-old man, but I, I just... <laughs> Actually, you, you, I want to tell you something. I thought about this illustration, and I, I literally put a question mark beside it. I was like, I'm not going to tell these people this, but... Especially those who, who do Christian rap that come out of sort of a reformed tradition. There's a good number of them. And some of the music is outstanding. Especially the way that it, it can communicate the truths of the gospel and the reformed faith in a particular context. One of my, my favorite artists isn't someone that you probably know. Uh, he's, he's, he's pretty famous, but uh, he's not like the big top guys. His name is Bizzle. Bizzle. He comes out of California. And, and Bizzle's life was one in which um, he grew up in Section 8 housing, in the inner city, um, pushing drugs. And it was all about, for him, it was all about money and nothing else. I mean, he would even, he would even pimp women out for money. And he was, he was terrible and vicious and awful. He got into rap because he, he followed some of the big guys, the secular rappers, you know, like Ye and all these other, Jay-Z and all these guys that are out there doing rap music. He followed them and loved their music and was doing drugs, trying to make it in rap. And then he, his part of his testimony is really interesting and terrible, awful. He, he realized that he was actually, listen to this, he was actually pimping out the daughter of a pastor. And it was, it was through that that... Um, he was confronted with his wickedness and his evil and the harm that he was causing. And he put his trust in, in Christ. And then he tried to, to continue to do rap, and he even tried to continue to do rap as a, as a Christian. And everybody was telling him he was, he was never going to make it. And if he wanted to make money, you got to keep doing it the way of the world. And he kept hearing that from everybody. People were laughing at him. And then he created his own label. And this is why I'm telling you this. He created his own label. And guess what the title or the name of his label is? And it's in all of his songs. There's always a refrain in this regard. His label is called God Over Money. God Over Money. The only way you're going to hear Jesus' words, you cannot serve God and money, is by serving God. And everything else is a lesser thing. Everything else takes its place. God is over money. Do you know that? I hope so. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for your love for us in Christ. We thank you for constantly bringing us back to what is true, for helping us, Lord, to navigate the difficulties of life in a world that has rejected you. And I pray, Lord, that you would work in us, continue to work in us, to help us not only to hear the truth, but by the power of your spirit, believe it and follow it for our own good and for your glory. This morning, Lord, as we come to the table, um, we come from the, the preached and spoken word to the word that is visibly in front of us of your sacrifice and your death and what that means for our salvation. 
And we're so thankful, Lord, that you are with us here in this place and that you are spiritually present with us at the table and that you're here to remind us, Lord, through your word and through communion of all that you have done for us and of how much you love us and of the renewed commitment that we all should have to follow you. Lord, we are needy and we are sinful and we know that. We're not worthy of your favor. We're not worthy of your love. We're not worthy of your consistent kindnesses. But you offer them to us each and every day, each and every hour, each and every moment. And so this morning, before we come and partake, we take a few moments and we just silently, Lord, acknowledge. Maybe it's about our obsession with the material. Maybe it's about a sexual sin. Maybe it's about a broken relationship. Maybe it's about an issue with anger. Maybe it's about, uh, Lord, something going on with our children. Whatever it is, because of Jesus, we can bring this sin before the throne and be forgiven. And so, Lord, hear our prayers as we confess our sin. You remind us in your word that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us. And we thank you for that. And now nourish our souls as we come in faith to your table. Set apart these common elements and use them for your holy purpose in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are a believer this morning... And